Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Welcome to another edition of Musical Talk. I'm Thos Ribbits, a man who's been described as a complete blithering idiot, although my critics have been less kind. Well, I'm not going to give you a long preamble today because we've got a packed programme. Mostly we're going to be talking about a piece of quality writing, a new musical that was in Edinburgh last year and is now coming to London called Buried, more of which in a minute, And then later on in the programme, we'll have the first of our Edinburgh journals from David Herzog, which will be a series of very short vignettes in future episodes of Musical Talk, where he explains the preparations he's undertaking to get a musical show up to the Edinburgh Festival Fringe this year, which will make a nice change, because usually we hear about things from Edinburgh after the fact. But with David, we'll be hearing about what you have to do to get there in the first place. However, to business. Let's talk about Buried, a new musical. Now, those of you with long memories but short fingers will remember a conversation I had with Michael Gordon Shapiro at last year's Edinburgh Festival Fringe where we raved about this new piece of writing. It was identified as being great by a lot of people. It was the winner of the National Student Drama Festival last year. It was also one of the stage newspapers, Picks of the Fringe for 2017. And let us not forget that it was the silver medalist for Musical Talk's Pick of the Fringe. And absolutely wonderfully, that show is now coming to London. So if you can make it to the capital, you can see Buried, a new musical, at the Pleasance Theatre London, uh, which is in Islington. It's the sister venue for the Pleasance Theatre in Edinburgh. And that can be found in Islington between Tuesday the 10th of April and Sunday the 15th of April. There'll be more details later on in the programme about how you can see it. But let's find out more about Buried, a new musical. In a minute, you'll hear a conversation I had in Edinburgh last year with the writers, Cordelia O'Driscoll and Tom Williams. But you might quite rightly be asking, what's it about? Well, here's the blurb. He's a charming young professional. She's a sarcastic thrill-seeker. After their first date, this young and fun-loving couple form a unique relationship when they discover something they have in common. They're both serial killers. Buried tells the story of Rose and Harry as they join forces, setting out on a trail of murder and deception while trying to negotiate their way through the world of normal adult relationships. Combining a beautiful folk-inspired score with a bitingly funny script, this new musical puts a sinister spin on the traditional rom-com formula, examining the world of relationships when pushed to extremes. And I must say, it is a tremendously funny, tremendously tuneful, but very dark comedy. And it's one of those rare pieces that there's a point within it, very underplayed, very subtle, it's there for you to pick up if you want to, which I think you'll take home after the show and spend a lot of time thinking about, because I certainly did. And the piece is very clever, it takes you on a journey with the characters, and then there's a point where the tables are turned on you as the viewer. I'm going to say no more about that, except to say this is a great show. So in a minute we'll hear that conversation I had with Cordelia O'Driscoll and Tom Williams, the writers. But first, let's hear our five-minute medley of some of the songs from the score of Buried, a new musical. Just like me, in another body a dream where I have been calling for someone And I've never gotten a reply Your story In line with my life Just memories Of always living on the outside I don't think I've ever met another me before Sometimes I think I'm 
imagine what could be if I let myself feel? Is it something within my power to hold hearts on sleeves? Let my arms grow wider If I look you in the eye Cry when people cry Or laugh when children smile Then maybe I'll be something ordinary Something ordinary Like her My name's Cordelia O'Driscoll and I'm the composer and co-lyricist of Buried. And I'm Tom Williams. I wrote the book and directed Buried. And co-lyricist. Co-lyricist, yeah. I'm sure. But basically what I have here are the two people who are behind Buried. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, and yeah. it's creative parents. <laughs> <laughs> and it is such a good show. I'm going to lay my cards absolutely on the table immediately. I think it's a magnificent show. Thank you very so, much. Thank you so much. I would like, if you can, and you may want to do this together, just give us a little little uh, thumbnail sketch of the plot without giving anything away. Mm -hmm. What's it about, is the old-fashioned question. Uh, it's about two serial killers that end up meeting through online dating and discover that they are 
sort of both shared this secret that they're that this is what they like to do and decide to partner up to make things a bit more fun a bit more interesting uh, and in the process end up developing feelings for each other which tend to be totally alien to sociopaths and psychopaths i suppose without giving any more away uh, sort of the end and their adventures thereafter yes, yes. yeah yeah <laughs> Oh yes, um, there's no intention of uh, giving away the uh, the ending or any of the magnificent twists. Or no, we have had a review that did do that. Yes. Uh, we, we had to, to ask it to be edited out. Yes, uh, yeah. That's clumsy. Yeah. <laughs> Very clumsy. There's plenty of meat on the bone still to discuss. Though. Yes. Can I say, thematically, the thing I find most fascinating about the show, apart from the fact it's so well crafted, is its tone. You know, from that description, you'd think, hmm, murderers, hmm, therefore probably murder. Yes. Um, you know... <laughs> And there's a lot more besides. And yet, it's very, very witty. And it's very, very witty from the start. And the audience, I think, buy into that. Because there is an element here. In fact, I'm going to ask you this question. When you were coming up with this, you must have thought to yourselves, will the audiences engage? So can I ask you, what's the creative process? And how did you make sure that you were able to craft this in the way that the audiences did engage? Which they have. Or certainly the experience I've had was very positive. Yeah. I think we were both worried about the tone and people not being able to relate to the characters because obviously it was a bit of a gamble writing a musical about serial killers. It's Um, slightly outside the experience of most people. Yes, they're (laughs) not particularly normally relatable characters. But I think the way that we try to go about it is making the fact that they're serial killers kind of not the most important thing about them. What's most important and what is most explored is just how they're both incredibly unconventional people who live incredibly unconventional lives, obviously. And so it's more of an exploration of what it's like to be so unconventional, yet you're in, and then suddenly put into this conventional relationship with two, with another person who's just like you, I guess. Which is a thematic piece throughout, isn't it? Yes. The, uh, you know, it's the, the similarity and uh, can one feed off that? And is the feeding off that positive or negative as well? Which can be both. Mm. I mean, you know, it's not. It's, this is clever and sophisticated in the sense it's not saying there's simple. You know, it, it, it's not one note in any sense. Mm. There's, a, there's a whole wealth, it seems to me, of real and realistic personality in what seems a slightly heightened situation. Mm. If that's fair. I think that's exactly it. It's yeah. It's it's looking at the story about a relationship, but just putting it in an in an absurd setting, which kind of gives it its comic edge. Uh, yeah, we were worried that making. The, the two main characters, serial killers, would alienate a lot of people or make people uncomfortable because there's a lot of kind of violence and murder entwined with the plot. But we had to make sure that the leads were witty and charming and you, that you'd empathise with them, otherwise no one would really care about them or what happened to them. There has to be an engagement of some variety, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I think the best way to do that was just by making the characters as charismatic and relatable as possible. And we got very lucky with the actors that we cast in that role as well because they are hugely charismatic performers and people and they inhabit these characters so well that it's really difficult not to like them and then kind of you really buy into their relationship and feel awful. And it's, it's funny, we get so many people at the end saying, I was so upset and... and they really felt for these people who had done kind of horrible things yeah, yeah. on stage. And so that's uh, that was really, really kind of the angle we were going for. Hopefully that's what we, what we got right. So how did it come to be? I mean, forgive me, have you worked together before? Is this your first piece together? We've never written anything together, but we... Because we've been at uni together for the past yes. three years. And we've and done... Which one do you mind uh, Sheffield University. Lovely. So we've done, we've done other shows together. We were both in the uni production of Sweeney Todd, and we both... Uh, I see your tastes, by the way. Yes, I know. And then we both did... Uh, Tom directed and I produced a production of the last five years. Oh, right, OK. After that. And then, yeah, Tom and Jack, who's the musical director of the show, they've started a theatre company called Collar Watcher Theatre Company, who's put, we're putting it on with them. And we've done a few shows through them. But then... Yeah. I think the writing of it was a bit of a joke, really, wasn't it? It, it? it really did actually start as a joke. We thought, we'd done the last five years and it was this nice two-hander about this relationship that was an interesting show. And we thought it would, be, it would be great fun to do something similar but really absurd, like two famous serial killers, you know. And, and, and it, it became a joke. And then we thought, actually, there might be some legs to that idea. It could be quite fun. Some of the music could be really silly for that. And then we thought about taking a show to, to Edinburgh about six months before we were going to go up and thought actually we could just write this and see what happens and uh, we're very very glad we did it's Mm. uh, it's, it's a remarkable piece I think it's a remarkable piece the fact it's done in six months in Edinburgh terms it's actually quite a long gestation period but Mm. still not really in terms of the quality coming out of the machine we were both finishing uni at the time as well so it was a bit of a (laughs) yeah you had other things on yeah Yeah. it was a bit bit of a uh, (laughs) cobbled together but it 
people somehow feel like that. yeah well luckily I think because we managed to we'd done it by the time we finished around the time we were graduating we had like time of our full on rehearsal period and it changed a lot and I think it changed we did a preview about a week before we came up here mm. and the preview we were 10 minutes over time so oh, we which you can't be obviously here, yeah, yeah so we and we've changed it instead of cutting things we actually reshaped the whole show so the, the show is so different from the preview even and a week before you came up yeah oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah like we, thank we, god we, we were making days. musical professionals <laughs> yeah it was, it was a bit, I need a new song and I need it <laughs> yeah it was quite yeah we thank were, god we didn't have to write anything yeah. new it was all just no, cutting bits off yeah we were kind of rejigging on the coat chart yeah. like mm. trying to actually after our preview we had this hugely valuable Q&A session where a lot of our experience has been going to theatre Q&A sessions asking the director why they wrote it and what for and we just said to the audience we want to know what you liked about it what you didn't what you understood what you followed what you were into and we got loads of feedback people got really enthusiastic about that and we had so much to go off that we were able to craft the show into something just people want to see so because it's been tailored to an audience exactly yeah because there were bits that we were always I think because, because the show from the start of the rehearsal period, which was essentially the start of July to the end of July, the show evolved so much. And I think we were still clinging on to bits from the start. So it, it was a bit of this mishmash show that didn't really work. So from the preview, we could really see, OK, this is like the core of the show. And then we re- worked it around it. And it's to be honest, focus, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we only had that version in the dress run. The, the, first, <laughs> the first full run of the show it is now was, was the first show, <laughs> the opening night. Blood pressure, yeah. high. <laughs> it was very high at that time. Yeah, yeah. it's gone down now. <laughs> down now yeah. yeah, a bit. Yeah, it's a proven piece now. But I'd like to go back a step earlier, if I may, to this sort of creative, a throwaway idea, and it's got legs. But then, as you're compiling it to become a show, both in terms of book and lyrics and song, mm. you've got to think about pitching it. You've got to think. You know, how, it's back to the how can we make people engage? I'm, I'm very interested, but you then took it to the preview, which is actually where the final polish, finesse, restructuring has really made it a tailored piece. Mm. But it, it is obviously something you have to imagine and put through at the beginning when you're creating. I'm just, it's because it's so, it seems to me to be so perfectly pitched in the sense that it's light and funny, and I say witty, and it's sustained wittiness as well. You've said the word silly, and there is silliness in it, but I wouldn't describe it as a silly show by any means, actually. I think it's, a, it's got that lovely, it's got a lovely sort of dark, toothy edge to it. There's a little bit chewy on it, something chewy on it. Um, but also, by being sufficiently light and chewy, you're then allowed, you've earned yourselves as writers the right, the right to go off and do the darker things that have to happen later on to make the, the actors the dynamic in the second half, shall we say, for want of a better way of phrasing it, because there are places where it gets very dark. I'm not going to say what those places mm. are, but, you know, really, they almost couldn't be more dark in some senses. Mm. And you're asking an audience to travel on, with you on that journey, and you've managed to do that, but that, that seems to me that takes a lot of thought. I'm just curious to know what, how, how you got, you know, how did that process work for you? And I understand that it got to the preview, but I, I, I just want to know where you two were doing it mm. if that's okay I'm sorry I'm just dissecting your creativity no, no, no. That's, uh, that's delightful I think the moment that you're referring to the kind yes. of the darker uh, area of the show was something that always I think was in the, the, the play from the beginning I think it always had to be there because it's very easy to forget that the, the show is about murderers and I think and what murderers do yes exactly <laughs> yeah. and we, we made a point that we didn't want any violence on stage and we no. didn't want any kind of gore uh, I thought that would be a terrible idea and, and again it's, it, the show isn't really about that um, but these then, are sound decisions I mean this is exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about That's, mm. these are a good set of well, that's a criteria on, but sure. there's more to come, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm yeah. Interrupted you, sorry. No, no, it's quite all right. But yeah, so it, we, we made that decision of, of, of kind of no violence on stage. And then I suppose it would have been easy for the concept of what is happening to get lost and, and to feel almost sort of that it was not disrespectful, but churlish in the way that it deals with human life. And I think that moment in the middle just brings it home that actually we are talking about something that does happen and is, 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 comes from a very dark place psychologically. And it also it's, it's, it's kind of, it, you need something stark to create the sort of rift in the drama and the conflict between, yeah. between the two leads. And I think it just needed that reminder. It needed to be brought down to earth a little bit, I think. Um, I mean, I think it's exactly the right decision. I don't think you could do the show without the acts occurring in the way that they do and the progression. Well, I'm saying no more than that. 
but it, you do need that, and I can see that you will have lost some audience at that point, mm-hmm. but hopefully not many. Yes. Yeah, it, it seemed to sit quite well with most audiences, really, I think, because you know they are not, you know, the best people in the world. They are murderers. <laughs> like that. Not yeah. the best people in the world. Not the best people in the world. Not the best people. The best. <laughs> well, maybe not the worst, but they're definitely not the best. You need, you need that little bit, but I think... I think the audience are really surprisingly forgiving. Yeah. Like, it's, yeah. I, audiences come out and they're like, God, I just don't care that they murder anyone. I just, like, and it's, it's quite funny. I think, I don't know really how we got to that stage, like, through the creative process, because it's been a, a, a proper collaboration. Because when we started doing it, we hadn't written anything. I mean, Tom had the idea of, like, where he wanted the story to go. An arc. Yeah, but yeah, even sure. then, that's changed so much. So we would kind of would work on songs kind of one by one ish but not in the right order like the no. first song we wrote was the one where they made up their backstories um, oh. yeah, um, yeah. just because we thought it would be fun yeah <laughs> so that's the first and it really we was yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so that's the first well, one in we way, wrote. You're, that's where our art mirrors life isn't it yeah mm. you're creating their backstories the yeah. characters are creating their backstories yeah, yeah exactly so I guess it works um, and then we kind of just went through them and I think the more we wrote the music the more that we kind of could see where the show would be going and I think the the music was a huge uh, sort of precedent for the tone of a lot of the script as well because the music came before the songs came before most of the dialogue and so it was really with Cordelia the style of the music that she writes it's kind of very light and beautiful anyway so it was yeah it, it was it was it was lovely to actually have that sort of laid out that tone and then I think that yeah a lot of the character work and the dialogue and the scenes that were written kind of flowed from that made it made it sort of light and happier so yes it's it's world creation and tone creation and how they mesh isn't it and music mm. really helps set a tone because an audience responds emotionally to music it just yeah. does True. and if the music is directing you in one way then you can sort of see where you're going mm. yeah I think we always wanted the music to contrast the, mm. the tone I mean not that I mean the tone is still quite it's not heavy, but I think we didn't want, you know, the opening sequence is, yes. the music is very folky and light and the actual act in the opening sequence aren't exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's that kind of, um, the want to kind of contrast it to add to the tone, I guess. And then there is the, I think there's the beauty of the, the reveals as it goes through. And I mean at every level, I think, I mean, just let's analyse the very first scene, if you like. Sure. Um, if, if I may, we open with a woman in a restaurant and she's obviously waiting for a blind date. And we, uh, that's, that's a song. We, the audience, get that quite quickly. And then someone turns up and it's her first date. And you, we've all been through the experience. So, you know, humanity is uh, joining in there. There's yeah. empathy. Um, and then you quickly see that the date's a horrible man and she doesn't like him. And so far, so, you know, that's, that's a perfectly normal, perfectly um, understandable thing and you feel her embarrassment because she's obviously trapped over dinner with someone she doesn't much like she calls him a wanker let's be honest yeah. <laughs> um, and he's played that way as well I know it's just a cameo but my world <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he, people don't want to see him but, um, but then there's this odd thing isn't it we see very much that she doesn't like him our natural instinct is that we would want to get away as soon as possible thanks but no thanks kind of an ending for mm-hmm. that date if we were stuck in it and oddly, she's made it plain she doesn't like him, and she puts her hand out, and it's suggested that they're going to go back to bed. Mm-hmm. And suddenly, the audience is wrong-footed, and that's beautiful. And there's all this kind of, you know, we're led down a garden path, and then we're veered off it, and that happens lots and lots of times. And then it, it happens again. There's a, you know, this is a, a repeated sequence. The iteration works very well uh, for narrative purposes, but also for comedy purposes mm-hmm. as well. You know, so this is this is where it works so well. Every every part of it is linked brilliantly. Uh, on your light and beautiful music. Thank you. <laughs> and so that just that opening song alone and how it ends, which reveals so much about principal characters, opens up that world bit by bit. And I suspect if I were to write the story down in dramatic points as far as I could see it, it would be a lovely, neat progression of very clever left-right tacking to keep us on our toes. It's not a simple narrative in mm. that sense, or it is wonderful, and that's the beauty of it. It's mm. simple, accessible. And yet it's so clever, it's so back and forth and witty and smart. I'm not selling this even well enough, but um, that's how I saw it. I, I, I was delighted by its simple complexity, if I may be offering you that. Well, thank that's you very, very much. <laughs> um, that sounds to me, however, like a lot of work. <laughs> Did it feel, bearing in mind you had so much on as well, how much, is, how much of that was... How much of this writing is innate in you and how much, of, you know, how much is sweat, how much is inspiration and how much is perspiration do you feel? <laughs> 
That's good. That's, yeah, that's really good. Um, I, you know what? I, I suppose that a lot of it came sort of quite naturally in that we wanted to create this story arc and we had a, a point in mind when we were making it. We didn't want to push any information or, or uh, answers on an audience. We just wanted to suggest mm. questions and and we we, we, we sent the, the yes, script to a couple of audience. people. No, mm. certainly not. Because he doesn't um, speak down to the audience at all. It's fantastic. Well, that, that is great to hear. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, we had some help. Um, we, we sent sort of the script to a couple of people to see what they thought and got some feedback. I mean, for instance, um, Kadili's mum, hugely helpful. Um, with kind of just guiding and shaping the story. I think a, a lot of it really just sort of happened, actually. <laughs> and, and I would say that a lot of the... We, we tried to keep a really open, um, kind of a su- suggestive atmosphere amongst the cast, uh, whether people like things, whether they don't like, what they think they could be changed, even if it's just down to the, how a line is composed. Um, so I, I, it feels like a collaboration, actually, a lot of the time. We really you've, want you've to hear. That, and that's, that is important, isn't it? I think yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. definitely. I um, think well, the rehearsal process was um, was helpful for that because I think the cast are all incredibly creative. And workshopping on the spot. Almost, yeah, it? Mm. definitely. Particularly with the movement side of it, um, mm. we had uh, our choreographer Phoebe Phillips who mm. came in and we did. Um, it was very free because we didn't really have many. I- we had ideas what we wanted it to look like, and obviously it's not a very dancey show. It's more just like. No. Specific movement, but a lot of that I was don't workshop. Think we're jazz hands here, right? No, <laughs> <laughs> well, very far from it, I think. Yeah. Um, I'm glad to hear you say yeah, that. Yeah, yes, yeah. that's good. Um, but uh, it's a broad church musical theatre. <laughs> <idea. laughs> yeah, it's exactly a broad church the musical. <laughs> Come and see it. Um, but uh, I didn't mean that broad church. But I see what you're saying. <laughs> Yes, that could also be yeah. that could be the second musical. Yeah, that's going to be number two. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think uh, having a cast who was so creative, and also I think because we we had to write it so quickly because we mm. basically signed our name on the dotted line to come to Edinburgh and hadn't yeah. done anything. Um, <laughs> well trodden path. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, so we had to do it so quickly. So actually seeing it done helped us to like rework it so much because it just you know yeah. gives it in a whole different light and how things work. Um, so that was really useful. Mm. So, you've been, there's collaboration, there's the tidy up. When did you think you had it exactly as you wanted it? You know, when is D-Day for you? When was D-Day for you? After, after the preview, clearly. I st- when, I when did you feel comfortable then? I the opening night. I oh, think really? so. That was the yeah. first time that we, the, the cast ever fully went through without stopping the, the show that it is now. Mm. Because, because we were over time. Yes. I think we were annoyed at the preview because we were like, oh, we really like the show. But yeah. we're, we're in 10 minutes over, so yes. this can't be the show. Um, and then we, once we managed to rework it, and then when we finally did a read-through and got under an hour, we were just like, just, everyone was just so like over the moon <laughs> yeah. because it had taken so long. Yeah. yeah, so we got it then, but then we hadn't properly rehearsed it really. So it was, the real moment was, I think, the first show when we, it came together and the audience really liked it. It was like, oh my God, like, thank you. But then what I would, what I would say is that um, we're hoping to do a tour. Oh, I wanted to ask, where's it going? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I would like to change it further. Mm. I think we've got a really good thing going and I'm really happy yes. with it. But I think there are, there are parts that we had to cut out to keep it under time that I still think would add something nice to the show. I mean, we're not talking, you know, another hour. No maybe in a, another 10 minutes or, or 15 at the most but I think there's a bit there of breathing is, time perhaps. Yeah, yeah I think so um, because it has to be placey in Edinburgh yeah. but that's lovely but there are yeah. other ways of doing it absolutely and, and I think yeah the, the, the show wouldn't suffer from having a moment where the audience can relax slightly because it is so rapid but um, yeah I, th- I think, I think the, the, the final version is yet to come but um, we're, we're really pleased with this one, to be fair. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely going to ask you about further iterations, further how people can see it, how people can stay in contact with you as we go on. Mm. Wow. But I would like to talk about your cast. What was so superb as well. Um, I think it would be fair to say that you have two main leads who play the, uh, the central characters. Uh, and then you have a, a supporting cast of three, I think it is. Four. Is it four? four. Oh, yeah. they, well, they, because they play so many characters, they have yeah. merged yeah. in my yes, imagination yeah. into, into a... But they do it so marvellously, and they pitch each character exactly right for each moment. Mm. You know, um, you must tell me this. There's a, a chap who... Uh, uh, I'm going to call him the chap who does Kermit the Frog. Mm. Yes. Um, would I be right in guessing that he ad-libs a little bit? Um. Um, 
to, was he supposed to be turned off completely yesterday? Because I think he went down to minor volume, and then because I noticed the uh, the orchestra were laughing, <laughs> I got he... the impression that he was just just going off piece to little. He's um he that his name is Lawrence Hunt. Yes. Um, name and shame. <laughs> name and he's, shame. He's oh, a, no. he's a wonderful yeah. wonderful actor, mm. and he he really struggles sometimes <laughs> with keeping it together because um, he just he enjoys himself he's so a much. Of energy, yes. Isn't he? Yeah. Um, but uh, and the audience yes. love that. They could tell. Yeah. Him. And he also didn't over under, he didn't overbalance anything. That was the great thing. Yeah. yeah. He was allowed to have a little bit of fun. Yeah. It really aided the ap- atmosphere and feeling. Yeah. And it didn't in any way draw focus actually. Yeah. Sure. That's the point. Yeah. Yes. Well, all those impressions of him, like he's very talented impressionist. Oh God, yeah. We we basically in, in the script was just the television is on. Yeah. And he oh, just re- we had this yes. wonderful rehearsal where he just reeled off all of these things he could do, all these impressions of famous film moments, you know, Jurassic Park, Harry Potter. And we kind of settled on those ones just so they didn't kind of, as you say, pull yeah. too much focus from the scene. But uh, I think so much of what we do with the cast is is playing to their strengths. And yes. one of his huge strengths is his voice acting and his impressions and, and his comedy. And uh, yeah, we just we want to put so much of that in. Um, I think hopefully we've just got the right amount. Yes, <laughs> but I don't want to um, undersell the other actors. So we'll talk mm. about the supporting characters first. Sure. Once again, you know, I mentioned uh, there's... Uh, all, all the others, they pitch each time right. I think that's the best thing I can say, to be honest. But, um, when the mood darkens and they are playing different kinds of characters, the audience responds. Mm. You know, these are not supporting characters who are just there to come on and do a turn. They're there to enhance the emotional journey of the story and they succeed absolutely in spades. Mm. However, our central characters are also remarkable because that's quite a... That's quite an ask, isn't it? Mm. I mean, it's an ask. It's a difficult thing for you to write, do as creators to create these two central characters who are not immediately sympathetic, but somehow have audience engagement with them. Mm. And then it must be very difficult for the actors because they're out there on the stage doing it, mm. and of course bringing themselves to it. How did you find your cast? And you, you directed, I think, Tom, as well. So you know, well, that's a collaborative process as well. You know, sure. How how easy was it for you all collaboratively to find that? way of finding engagement for the public yeah. well I think I think <laughs> another we, broad question again. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think we're, we're very lucky because we're all just students at University of Sheffield um, and we I mean when we did the auditions we'd only written half a song so we were really kind of we had an idea of what we wanted, but even then it was a struggle. But we just, as soon as basically the cast yeah. turned up, it was like, oh, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Particularly with Seb and Lindsay, their voices are so And the, the names of the actors are? So, uh, Sebastian Belli plays Harry. and Lin- Belli. 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 That's Italian. Very, yes. yeah. very interesting. Um, <laughs> yes, and then uh, Lindsay Mannion plays Rose. Um, yeah, beautiful voices, both lovely actors. I think they're both very natural, which is yeah. why, I think that's why we wanted them to do it, because the parts essentially is quite unnatural mm. and to make them engaging with an audience they have to be as normal as possible yes you do need, you need an odd kind of realism it's projected mm. realism isn't it because it yeah. can't be realistic and yet mm. it's a realism that we're ex- we'll accept yeah. is enough like us for us to connect yes mm. even though we don't you know most of us aren't murderers <laughs> I hope around the table fingers <laughs> <you know>. so, <laughs> <just> crossed uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I mean, we must thank them. I mean, the whole cast, and particularly Seb and Lindsay, just for being so quick at learning things because of the amount we changed yeah. in the last week. Oh, God. Like, yeah. I, we, we rewrote an entire song lyrically. Oh, gosh. Ooh, that the, that, um, that could be awful, can't yeah, yeah, the, the yeah. three. So that was the three girls that the, the song they sing together, all the lyrics changed. It, a couple of days before the, the, the real show, so and it's just been spot on. Yeah, like yes. they're they're, they're so wonderful. It was crisp. It was crisp perfection when I saw it. Mm. Oh, it really thank was. You. Thank you so much. But those characters, I love them because um, it's also clever, isn't it? Because uh, and once again, this goes back to the writing as well. They have once again, we're back to the shorthand terms, but they're mm-hmm. both psychopaths in some way, sociopaths, psychopaths. But the psychopathy of one seems to be more advanced than psychopathy of the other. Mm-hmm. And that ultimately creates, as you were talking about, tension and drama and rift and, in different ways. But actually betraying that, because you'd think if you read the tabloids, psychopaths were all the same. Yes. And of course, the public know better. But the public have to be reminded through good performances and good writing that that is the case. <laughs> uh, and it came out very clearly. And as a result, you know, it's, it's having successfully got an audience to feel some kind of connection with two psychopaths, then also to feel the sympathy, because there's a world of difference between empathy and sympathy, feeling sympathy for, I think, at least one of them. Mm-hmm. 
that things aren't going well for them in some <laughs> sense. You know, they, it's a, 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 a speech marks emotional level. But there is also the beauty of the narcissism of their relationship because they, what they, they've sort of fallen in love with their own image in each other as exactly. well. Exactly. And that's actually a bit less lovely. But understandable, people do it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but very, you know, it's all once again real. We get back to this realistic thing that actually I can trans I can project quite a lot of characteristics I know in a whole bunch of people. I hope we're not psychopaths, but we all have characteristics of this, that, and the other. Mm. And I could see those people as being real, I suppose. That's the point. They felt very real. And they weren't mugging their lines. They were very, you know, the comedy was natural, the comedy was character, mm -hmm. uh, and the comedy was their performance. You know, they didn't come on going, like, yeah. <laughs> Look at me, ladies and gentlemen. Hey. I've got a trombone. <laughs> None of that happened. No. Uh, let me write that down. Yeah. <laughs> Inters with trombone. <laughs> um, so I suppose I'm trying to compliment you and the performers for the complexity of their relationship, which then allows for re realism. Um, yeah. Well, that's very kind. It's 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 a funny mixture actually because I sometimes it hits me uh, more when I watch the play back again in that we have this kind of realism between Seb and Lindsay, but it's kind of juxtaposed with the absurd characters that the chorus play yes. coming in, and I think that gives them a, a more grounded. Yeah, it, it makes them feel more realistic, I think, because the only other characters in their world are absurd and sort of cartoonish. And I'm passing through. Well, exactly, yeah, temporary. And I think a big, a big apart from the the Joe, uh, the character yes. who turns up in the middle. So I think that was that was really important. If we wanted people to not be put off by the fact that they were kind of constantly murdering people, um, that these absurd cartoonish characters had to be how they viewed normal people. And so you're automatically more on side with them being more realistic because you're seeing the world through their lens, which is that everyone else is absurd and unrelatable and that these are the only two sane people in the real world. So that was kind of a big part of making them feel, as you say, realistic. And that's so wonderful because that's reflected in the lyrics as well and the songs, the, the business about, you know, you, um, they don't just see something of each other, they see each other's minds. Yes. And the mind is referenced so often. Uh, and, you know, it's a good cornerstone that one. I like that that um, you know they that they have fallen in love with each other's and therefore their own yeah. outlook mm. and mental outlook. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think I think yeah, I think that comes across in the lyrics of them. They're two people who've never come across anyone like them ever before, so they can't help but being so immensely drawn to each other. Um, and I think that's what makes it so interesting, in a sense, is because... And I think it's... I mean, it must happen in real life, surely. <laughs> like, and there must have been some moment where, like, two serial killers have actually... Or two psychopaths meet yeah. each other and realise, God, we're so similar, and like, mm. there's no-one else yeah. like us. Um, it's, uh, yes, us contra isn't it? Mm. Think, yes. Um, it's... It's, it is, it's so beautiful, in, you can cut it in almost any direction, and I think it's very beautiful whilst being very dark, you know. As we've mentioned, as all, oh, oh, it gets progressively darker, but whilst generating that genuine audience sympathy. So it seems, so let's talk about the audience. Mm -hmm. I think we touched upon this. The performance I saw was yesterday. It was sparkling, it was brilliant, it was sold out, you'll be pleased to know. Yes. You knew that. <laughs> um, there's no great accommodation, really. Um, but I was listening to the audience outside afterwards. Um, and I would say that 99% of the people were raving about how good it was. But there was... I heard one girl say that she hated it. I say girl, she was a teenage girl. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was having... A, a, it was an honest discussion. It wasn't just... Um, you know, she and her family were having a discussion about it, as far as I could gather. Mm -hmm. And it was that she just found something in it that she couldn't quite stomach. And I can absolutely see there will always be some people like that. Of course. Um, you're right, there's no violence on screen, but suggested violence is still psychologically damaging. Or, sure. or, 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 or disturbing is a better way of putting it. Mm -hmm. How have your audiences been? You know, what would you say proportionately are pro I can't imagine anyone's neutral but I would, I would, no. hope, I would, I would hope most people are pro it's, it's, as a piece of work it deserves huge support but. I'd say the feedback we've had has been actually su surprisingly positive I was expecting it to be a little bit more polarised yes, um, just because of the sensitive nature of some of the stuff in there but Actually, you know, it has been really quite overwhelmingly positive, the response we've had. There's been, I mean, we've, we've had the odd review which has seemed to not like the concept. And that's, you know, absolutely fair enough. It's not yeah. going to be to everyone's tastes. Um, well, you wouldn't want all shows to be well, like this, no, would you? No, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, and, and, and the, you know, when there's a, 
if someone has a problem with the concept or the, the idea or the tone of it, unfortunately we have to kind of sit back and say there's, yeah. there's not a lot we can do about that. Yeah. Like we, we kind of I've created seen it. Show, yes, yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. But actually, we, we've had a surprising amount of sort of support and, and positive feedback, uh, especially from American audiences. Uh, yeah, we've had a lot of kind of school trips and kind of groups of students and a lot of uh, American teachers asking about, you know, if, if the show would ever go to America and if they can use excerpts from it for well, school. And, yeah, yeah. I, d I don't really know why, but I, I, there may be something in the tone or the, the subject matter that appeals to, to, to people from the US. But it's, yeah, it's... we've had lots of, yeah, lots of American kind of teenagers have yeah. really liked it. There's been some kids who've come like three or four times yeah. when they've been in Edinburgh for like a week. Good lord. Um, yeah. so Season tickets. <laughs> yes, really, and uh, there are a couple of boys who, I think it, they came for their fourth time, we gave them posters, it was like, thank you so much for coming, because yeah. we have nothing really to give you, but like, here's some posters we yeah. have, like, thank you so much. Lowe, they, <laughs> <laughs> they weren't. No. But, uh, no, so, uh, yeah, we, 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 we've had good feedback, I would say. Um, I just wonder, by the way, I'm just, just trying to rack my brains why it should be particularly appealing to Americans, as far as it appears to be. I just wonder if there's that kind of sense of British murder is classy murder. Quite yes, I think you're absolutely right, and I think I think it is about the the English sort of style of the show, and and it's been, it's been very unapologetic for that. We don't actually ever make any reference to location in the show, no. which was good because we wanted to keep it relatable. We didn't want to locate it anywhere yeah, really. It's house and road, isn't it? Exactly, it's yeah. <laughs> and I think so. I think that sort of appeals alongside the idea of it being a very British style, the accents and the the kind of feel to it. Yeah, I think the accents really help because they vary. Quite immensely because Lindsay's from Northumberland, Seb's Welsh, uh, then Liv and Taya, uh, both Southern yeah. and Alex from Manchester. You know, it's, I think it's a very like. And of course, Lawrence can do any voice. Lawrence can do any voice. <laughs> he wherever he wants. Wherever yeah. he wants to come from, that's where he'll come from. Um, so I think I, I think it has a kind of. British charm, yeah. How, as much charm you can put on a musical about serial killers, I think. <laughs> but Kind Hearts and Coronets has been turned into a musical, um, I think it's called How to Succeed in Murder, no, is it something like that, um, in America, it's, and, that's, and that's absolutely trading on mm. posh British heartless murder, Yeah. and posh British heartless murder is pretty much, you know. Well if that's in fashion, we've, we've hit a gold mine yeah. there without <laughs> realising yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> More murder. Now, uh, <laughs> we spoke about this briefly off the record, but I think it's worth pursuing. There is, in your venue, which is C2, St. Columbus at the Castle, you are on in the afternoon, and then you're followed by Thrill Me, which is actually the Leopold and Loeb story, which, yes. I've just been, uh, which I've just referenced. Totally different stories. One is American, one is British. Uh, one is historic, one is um, contemporary. Uh, one is based on a real story, and one isn't. I hope not. <laughs> but, um, and yet, and yet, and yet... There are so many parallels. You know, it's essentially uh, two central characters mm -hmm. who are developing a relationship. This is Thrill Me, but also very the There's a kind of development of crime in both stories. Um, there's rifts. There's manipulation. Mm -hmm. It's They are thematically exploring very similar views in utterly, utterly different ways. But it was so exciting to me as, a, as an audience mm. to um, see one show and then see the other show in succession as I did as a double bill almost not quite knowing that's what I was going to get Right. have other people spoken to you about the odd parallel in the show that follows you in that venue and, and was it a booking accident? I think it must have been an accident I think it must have no been one's, no one's really mentioned it apart from um, some of the cast who have seen yeah. Thrill Me mm. they were like oh it's also about yeah. like murder and stuff um, but uh, there, was, <laughs> there was one chap I ran in ran into on the mile who whatever we were flying for this is the only point that, the only moment it's been pointed out to me where I was handing him a flyer and I said it's about two serial killers that fall in love and he just stared at it and went it's not gay is it and I was like no I think you might be thinking of thrill me I don't know I mean it's not, it's, it's not. but that's the only point at which I went oh god that is the show that's after us and that's uh, exactly the same description but it's, it's something in him yeah. yeah well yeah I don't know why maybe he was assuming that serial killers can't be women uh, I, I, I'm not sure what the point but uh, but yeah that's kind of the only time it's been pointed out there's been a similarity but I'm, I'm now obsessed with going to yeah, see you, it you must, I'd love to I mean I doubt we'll ever have an opportunity, but should we bump into each other again socially? I would love to know what you think mm. of it. Um, and I've also told them that they've got to see you. So um, <laughs> yes. they have said they can only see you if they're dressed in costume, of course, because they haven't got time to change. Uh, of course, of course. So yeah. if you discover some gentleman from the 1920s sitting in the audience, um, that's probably the cast of the next show. Yeah. But it's genuinely fascinating. 
uh, to me, just to, just to see those variations. And so I, I just did wonder if there was some kind of a, some master plan. Maybe C2's planners are it might be. great Maybe. psychopath yeah. lovers. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, double absolutely. bill, murder double bill. So talk, let's talk about the score a little bit, because it's a, a, a majestic score in some senses. Um, it fits perfectly. It never overwhelms. And I mean that as a compliment. You know, sometimes yeah. you can have a song which is so lovely and you think, oh, hang on, I'm now back in the story. Yeah. It actually, the, the marriage here is pretty perfect, I'd say. Oh, thank Lyrics, you so narrative much. and music. Thank you. Um, now, I think you're both co-lyricists. Yes. I've, you know, how, you were saying that the songs were written before the dialogue. Mm. Do, you find, do you find collaboration easy? Is composing and lyric writing, because that's a double threat. Yeah. You know, not every, you know, Cole Porter can do it, but um, <laughs> you know, um, Richard Rogers couldn't. I'm, I'm putting you amongst the gods here. <laughs> yeah, we must um, live up yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, right. Um, but, uh, you know, forgive me, once again, it's about <laughs> mining your inner core to find the right music. Hmm. Well, some composers can only compose in one way. Yeah, well, I, I've um, I've never written for musical theatre before, but I've, I've written... Sorry, people can't see this, but my jaw is on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, well, I, I haven't. I've, I've written... Um, a lot of songs because I, do, I yeah. sing and write songs and stuff um, as well um, so I think when we decided to do it I just kind of started writing music that I liked really um, and the way that we kind of would write the songs is that we would just kind of sit in a, in a room and I would have ideas musical ideas and then we'd write some lyrics or maybe Tom would write like something in prose or like a poem that I would then use as a prompt to kind of turn into lyrics, yeah. more like lyrical, a more lyrical version of it and then put it to the music that I've been writing and um, but it was pretty much like I'm pre like pretty much all the songs we wrote in the same, I, like, we wrote to together like in a room together. You actually musically yeah. together? Yes. yes. Oh, right. yeah. How interesting. Because um, not everyone can do that either. No. Sometimes you want the distance. Well I have to say it's been delightful like yeah. it's been so much, fun. so much fun everyone says that collaboration can be tough and difficult oh, I've, just, yeah, I've just had fun from start to finish the reward yeah. if you get it right yes so. yes I think we're lucky because to be honest we could have um, we get on as people but we'd never worked together before on a creative like writing level and we just decided to do it before we'd ever done anything. Yeah. So it could have been a disaster. It's like going on holiday. That's when you find out like, yes. <laughs> yeah. what your friends are really like. Yeah, yeah, maybe we should have gone on holiday first. Yeah. Then we would have seen. But um, no, it, luckily we get on so well and we write really well together. So it's just been really good fun. Like, it's the only thing that goes wrong is when we just distract each other and don't do the work. Yeah, fun gets in um, the yes. Yeah, literally. And then we're spending two hours about. and then we write like one line. Yeah. And we're like, right, we go to Edinburgh in a month. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, without one song without yeah. one, one song <laughs> it's, it's going to be, be a musical <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but no it's been so much fun and definitely a collaboration because I wouldn't have done it without Tom um, because I never would have because Tom had the idea and was like oh do you want to write the music it's like yeah sure so um, but at the same time I'd say Cordelia is, has had a huge part in editing a lot of the script and uh, and, and I would say directing as well uh, so I think it's sort of mutually dramaturg yourself uh, kind of yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually been a collaboration between us on uh, pretty much every I'd aspect of it yeah, yeah. Um, which is uh, really nice actually because uh, it's a real double input which is really yeah because even on like writing some of the harmonies because obviously they're for two people when we wrote the songs yeah. we would sing them together so a lot of that was done together and yeah I think it's just it's been really nice that it has been a proper collaboration I haven't felt like oh, I've done something and you've done something and then we just appeared like six months later and just add it together it's like the entire way through it's just been like well we'll meet today and we'll do some more work and then we'll meet it's more of a fusion than a graft yes mm. yeah. and I use graft in both the senses <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes no it's been it's been great fun Stuff falls on the cutting room floor. Mm -hmm. Are there any sort of avenues that you would have liked to have explored? You've already said there are stuff you'd like to put back in on mm -hmm. breathing space or just sort of developmental moments. But so, but earlier on in the process also, were there avenues you were exploring which then didn't come to fruition? There were. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a quite considerable one. Um, which a big old was, avenue. Yeah, yeah. big, big a avenue. Big avenue. Away one, it, yeah. was, it was originally a, a, a play within a play okay. and we kind of had this idea that, that we the audience would be watching uh, a dress run of a show that was about to happen and the story was written and composed by uh, the man directing the rehearsal and actually the For story example. yes <laughs> yeah and um, and the so the story kind of uh, a lot of it came from him and a lot of the ending was wrapped up in this character and we we considered it and we we sent it around and and it felt 
a bit too convoluted to put into an hour and I think you wouldn't get to know that framed kind of framed concept well enough to care about it and it might be more confusing than beneficial and, and how did that connect to the psychopath story I'm sorry was that, was that the play within the play yes oh I see Which so is distancing though isn't it as well yeah it, it kind of ended up that you just didn't really care mm. you, you, you cared so much because it was still a, it was only like only around 10 minutes could be devoted to the director's yeah. storyline so you still cared so much about the, the serial killers and then but then instead of the ending being with them it was with the director and you just didn't care yeah, that's right. so I mean that was changed on the first day of rehearsal though. and that I'm was cut. so glad yeah. as well, because you really now do empathise with these people these, yeah. these two leads much but you've more you've got to as well yeah. Yeah. And, and we've already said there could be a barrier to that so actually removing mm. a possible distancing operation yeah. is probably the right idea I think also so. it's an idea that you can always use another day absolutely yeah. that's going back yeah. on the shelf as a, framework, <laughs> as a framework, that's fine. Yeah. Yes. Anything else musically? Um, well, we we I've cut five minutes of music from what it is now. I did that in like the last week before yeah. the show, before we did the show um, after the preview. Purely just because of time, and, and to be honest, it made the songs better as well. Um, we, I managed to. I was worried how I was going to do. Important skill, and so few people. Yeah, got exactly. It. So a lot of the songs were very long. Um, and for example, the opening sequence where she went on, goes on dates, I just cut an entire date from there, which is actually yeah. sad because it was a very funny yeah, date. It's very funny. Date. But um, uh, yeah, it was just the message time. has got across, isn't it? You, you, yeah, you get the story, exactly. So, so and we cut down. Poor waiter. Yes, I know. <laughs> so yeah, I think I, it was just kind of shaving edges off things and mm, just yeah. making it a lot smoother. And it, now it's just so pacey that I don't actually think I would add anything back into the music because I think it works. Um, Really, mm, it's very cohesive. That's a peaceful stop. Yeah. Cohesive musically, cohesive narrative, cohesive performance. I, mean, <laughs> I like what I did with that. <laughs> I don't think anyone noticed. <laughs> so, I've got to ask this: mm-hmm. How can people see it here in Edinburgh and possibly beyond? It's on in Edinburgh until the end of the festival, mm-hmm. and we're hoping to to do a tour afterwards. But it's all a bit up in the air at the moment. We so, just don't know. Yeah. Um, we're still trying to find theatres that uh, would be interested in programming it. Yeah. Um, and I think by the end of the festival, we'll, we'll have a better idea of, of where it might be going. Yeah. We're also going to try and uh, do a cast recording of the. My oh, very next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've had a lot of people asking about that, which has been really wonderful to hear so I think um, we're, we're trying to put together a mailing list of, of people who are interested in Colour Voce and I think we'll be sending a track or two out as soon as it's recorded and then we'll we'll, we'll put a put a whole sort of album up of the yeah. songs from the show um, which would be nice yeah at some point can I go on your mailing list please oh, absolutely yes, yes. <laughs> you can indeed yeah so obviously there are potential futures for this show how can people therefore find out what those are if they're not up here in Edinburgh? Do you have websites, Twitter, is there a Facebook page? What, what, what's the best way of staying in touch for anyone who's been listening? Uh, well, we've got a Twitter page, mm-hmm. uh, which is um, for the theatre company, which is Colavoce Chef. Do you like to spell that? Uh, yes, it's uh, C O L A V O C E S H E F. I believe so. I think and hope well so. Well done, you. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, Colavoce Chef on Twitter. And, uh, and that's all your characters on Twitter, isn't it? <laughs> yes, <I think> so. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, and then Colavoce Theatre, if you just type that into Facebook, that'll come up as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's where you'll be posting information about tours? I think so, yes. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? So yes. people can find out and perhaps hear yes, more Yes, well. that, that will be the first mailing list. Call, yeah. Yes, the, point. the mailing list as well. Yes, sure. yeah. What about the two of you? Do you two have contact details? Uh, yes. Well, I mean, we made a, I made a Gmail account We've for us the other Gmail day. We've got a Gmail account now. And we, I have yet to use it, but it yes. is uh, williamsodriscoll at gmail.com. Which also might require some spelling. spelling. <laughs> uh, do you want to spell it? You can spell it. I think it's, you go the long ones. I see yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S-O-D-R-I-S-C-O-L-L. At, at hotmail.com. Gmail. <laughs> oh, so I, close. I was so close yet so far. <laughs> at uh, gmail.com. At gmail.com. Yes. yes. Correct. Yes. Now spell horse. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's um, yet to be used, but if people want to contact us specifically about mm-hmm. writing, that's that's where we will be. Yes. So people who are interested in the show, and it's obviously some interest, in fact, as we were talking about the American interest, that people may wish to put it on as well. That's something they could write to you about if they were interested? Yes, definitely. Absolutely. We've had some producers um, asking Excellent. about things and theatres coming to see it we've got I assume you didn't offer him a glass of wine (laughs) (laughs) no no not not then not under the circumstances no I don't think so Uh, but um, yeah I think we've got a few more people coming over the next couple of weeks to the end of the run Um, I think interest is kind of 
steadily just kind of gaining because we are now like the fifth top rated show at the Fringe, I think. Yes, um, we, we were fourth yesterday morning. I think we might be the fifth, fifth now. now. Um, you're still contenders. Yes, oh, yeah. out oh, yeah. of yeah. 3,000. And, and sellouts. Bad. I mean, that's the point. If yeah. you sell out, you know, you've, you've got it. Yes. All sorts of it. So, yeah, uh, very... Um, I mean, it's just been completely overwhelming. Such a surprise. It was just for fun, really, and then now we were really, we, we were really upset the fact that we we were looking at doing the show in a in a 150 seat theatre because we thought we're never going to fill it and it's going to feel very empty. Uh, yeah. We were hoping for 30 to 40 a day just to cover really? our costs yeah. and break even. Well, I'm so glad you exceeded that. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we'll just Get see if out. we can sell out the O2. Then you yeah. know, who knows where we'll go from. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's been it's been such a delightful surprise. It really has. So the next question I've got for you, right? What are you, is there going to be further collaborative work between the two of you? So, Can yes. I say I'd love there to be because this is such, such a mature, sophisticated piece. Thank well, you very much. Very thank fun. you very much. I think we both like to. We're both, we've only just graduated. Mm. Um, so you're suddenly so, available to write musicals? Yes, well... <laughs> Although not so. to eat and earn any money, obviously. No, no, no. no, <laughs> no God, no. no. That's, that's years down the line. Um, <laughs> but yes, I think we both enjoy doing this so much that... Um, and we're both, yeah, pretty young. I'm 21 and Tom's 23. Mm. Just, that will change. Don't get clever. <laughs> yeah. I was once. I was, in fact, I was both of those. <laughs> yeah. Although not at the same time. Not no. at the same time. That would be impressive. That would be. Um, but yeah, so I think we're just... Yeah, we... I think this this has kind of been a bit more of a big thing than we were expecting. Yes. Um, so I don't know. I, yeah. Oh, well, thank you. I think we have to kind of ride this wave and see it out a bit, and mm. then. Um, but it, it has been very encouraging, and yeah. the kind of feedback and and um, you know, whatever we've had is, is it's really made me want to collaborate again. Mm. So I think if, if you've got a good thing going, I think yeah. you should you should make the most of it. D- difficult second album. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh god. Not even, not even thinking about no. that. <laughs> oh, but I hope that you shall. Mm. So my last question, if that's okay, and it's been such a delight talking to you both. But when the dust has finally settled, and you've uh, had a sit down, <laughs> um, what are you going to take with you from buried in Edinburgh? Hmm. That's a good question. What will um, we take with us? You mean in kind of like the experience of it? Or? Anything at all. Even if it's, oh, I like that chair that they use. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, well, I guess for me it's just been so much fun. Um, mm. The cast, like our whole team, there's 19 of us. Um, Which is a good old core, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, everyone's worked so hard. And I think because it's been successful, everyone's just having such a wonderful time. And everyone gets on so well. It's just been really lovely, and I think... I will always remember that for just how much fun it's been and mm. how, yeah, it's just been really, really enjoyable. It has. It's been such a whirlwind. And I think something I've definitely taken is that surprisingly good things can happen. And, mm. you know, your wildest expectations every now and then can be hugely surpassed. Mm. And it does feel like I'm yet to wake up. Uh, but, you know, we never expected this amount of success. and It's, it's been delightful. So... Yeah, I feel very optimistic from, from this. From and this grateful. Situation. And grateful, yeah. yes. Well, not so grateful as I am, but mm-hmm. I need to be able to talk to you both. So thank you so much for a wonderful conversation with some genuine insights into your creative work. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. And oh, yes. I am grateful for the show, which I have to tell you is one of the best I've seen up here in Edinburgh and deserves to be seen by many, many more people for many, many more months and years. And oh. well, there's not much more after years, is there? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for having us. Yeah. Musical talk. And there we are, Cordelia O'Driscoll and Tom Williams, the writers of Buried, a new musical. They were lovely people in Edinburgh, and you know what, they still are. They very kindly created that medley of songs that you heard earlier, especially for this episode of Musical Talk, whilst in the throes of their preparations for the London production of that show. They are supremely busy people, but you know what's more? They're tremendously nice and tremendously talented people. So, how can you go and see Buried, a new musical? Well, I hope that you will, and you can if you have access to London, because it's on the Pleasance Islington, which is in Carpenter's Mews, North Road, Tube Station, Caledonian Road. It really is a five-minute walk from that underground station. And it's on between Tuesday the 10th of April and Sunday the 15th of April. 
I always forget that you can quite often now see shows on a Sunday, so it's worthwhile finishing off your weekend in a wonderful way by seeing this show. Performances are at 7.30 in the evening. There's no matinee. Ticket prices are a mere £12. And there is an age restriction that you need to be 12 or over. For more details, either go to the website www.pleasance, that's P-L-E-A-S-A-N-C-E dot co dot UK, or ring the box office 020 7609 1800. Buried, a new musical, was a five-star show in Edinburgh, and I strongly recommend it. Well, on to other news. We've looked back to last year's Edinburgh, so let's look forward to this year's Festival Fringe in the hands of our old friend David Herzog. This is the first part of his Edinburgh Journal, and periodically over the next few months you'll be hearing short conversations from David explaining his preparations in taking a show, a musical show, to Edinburgh for this summer. It's a show inspired by Welsh culture and it's called Chedl, that's C-H-W-E-D-L, a good Welsh word. So, let's hear from David Herzog. Musical Talk Well, hello, musical talkers, and thank you very much to Mr. Thos Rippertz for letting me be on the program. I love being here, as always. And so my purpose for this conversation today is to tell you all about my trip to Edinburgh. Thos and I thought it would be a good idea if I sort of journaled my thoughts audibly onto the program for you, as we never had a chance to do that with a company before leading up to the events for the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. So let me start right at the very beginning, which is a very good place to start. The piece that we have decided to take up this year is a devised piece with music that we have entitled Hwedl. And Hwedl is the Welsh word. It doesn't technically have a direct translation, but it's most closely affiliated with Welsh folklore or Welsh legends. We thought it would be great to showcase the best of Welsh folklore and culture in a devised piece and include as much Welsh music as we can. Now, the piece is going to be as bilingual as it possibly can. Mostly it will be in English, obviously, since the vast majority of our audiences in Edinburgh will be English-speaking. But we wanted to tap into as much of the Welsh culture as we could. My wife and I recently moved back up to the North Wales area. A couple of years ago, we were living in London for years, and as much as I personally love London, it has been great to experience the vast culture and history that Wales has to offer, and we are going to try our best to include as much of that into Hwedl as possible. My wife, April, who is also a performer, is also currently head of the Pauline Quirk Academy in Llan Didna. Now, for those of you not familiar with the Pauline Quirk Academy, it's a chain of academies for students ages 4 to 18, darted all across the country, very similar to groups like Stagecoach and things like that, if you're familiar with them. The difference with... uh, Pauline Quirk Academy is, in addition to sort of singing, dancing, and acting, they also offer modules in non-musical theater as well as film and TV acting. And the Pauline Quirk Academy have actually opened up their own venue in Edinburgh this year for the Festival Fringe. It'll be their first year here in 2018, and they will be presenting works by students from academies across the country as well as with teachers. And that's where I come in. April, my wife, and her academy, we have gotten together with some of our teachers to put on a show of our own at this year's Festival Fringe. So again, friends, the reason that Thoss and I thought it would be a great idea to record some of my thoughts and journal some of my ideas as we go along this process is that it gives you, the listeners, a first-hand account of what it is like to take a show to Edinburgh. As I record this, it's late in February. We've already gotten the initial ball rolling with things like uh, booking accommodation for the Fringe. That's already taken care of. We've gotten our initial ideas and marketing plans and strategies to the PQA head offices, and they're starting to get the ball rolling with getting our show and our names and all that good stuff into the Fringe Festival brochure. So now that we've gotten some of the nitty-gritty stuff done with getting to the Fringe, we have now started the fun process of getting the piece written and devised. So the next step that we have as a company is to sit down, roundtable style, and just start throwing ideas into the mix. How do we want the show to come across? What messages do we want? What kind of arc do we want the story to follow? 
And also, more importantly, which pieces of Welsh folklore do we want to include? What are some of our favorite stories? A lot of it's stuff that we know, but most of it is going to be stuff that we have yet to research, yet to discover. What kind of music do we want to put in? Do we want to put in mostly Welsh folk music? Do we want to put in... Uh, contemporary Welsh songs. The possibilities for us at the moment are limitless, which is what makes this process so exciting. So keep tuning into Musical Talk, especially to the interviews and episodes that are presented by Mr. Thos Ribbits, and I will be keeping you up to date with everything that PQA Clan did know get up to. In the meantime, as always, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm still available at DavidHerzog06, and of course, follow Musical Talk at Musical Talk on Twitter as well, and all the other lovely social media things that we're on, and you can follow my process on there as well. And you can also follow my exploits with my current project that I'm working with, which is uh, working with the folks at Image Musical Theater and their production of Robin Hood, which I'm currently on the road with. Thank you so much for having me as always, musical talkers. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Musical Talk. There we are, David Herzog with the first part of his Edinburgh Journal. There'll be more from him in future episodes. And there'll be more from me in future episodes, because this episode is coming to its happy conclusion. I really hope that you enjoyed the conversation with Cordelia O'Driscoll and Tom Williams about Buried, so much so that you think about going to see it. And perhaps you'll see me there. I'm certainly going to see it. But for now, there's little for me to do except to say goodbye. Goodbye. See how correct I was. This episode of Musical Talk, edited by Thos Ribbits and presented by Thos Ribbits and David Herzog. Copyright Musical Talk 2018, except for the songs where the copyright remains with the creators, Cordelia O'Driscoll and Tom Williams. And my thanks to them for allowing us to play their songs on this programme. To find out more about the world of musical talk and listen to past episodes, go along to our website www.musicaltalk.co.uk or subscribe to us on iTunes and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can at MusicalTalkThos. But there is also the beauty of the narcissism. It's the beauty of the narcissism of um, 